Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host, back here in the studio. Good to be back after a couple of car reviews, trying to catch up on some EV stories over the last week or so, or a couple of weeks. So let me get right into it. Thanks very much for tuning in. All right, first story today is about Rivian. They've been doing a lot of stuff over the last few months, and they've now started and completed their first production vehicle. They finally made it to their first electric pickup truck, that is, the R1T. And that's after the US EV startup had twice proponed, postponed, excuse me, the start of deliveries. Now, Rivian CEO RJ uh, Scarridge confirmed the news on Twitter. He said after months of manufacturing pre-production models, the first customer vehicle left the assembly line in normal. <clears throat> that's the factory where they're built. Excuse me, the combined efforts of our team had made this possible, and they can't wait to hand the cars over to their customers, he says. Now, however, no further details were announced as to when exactly the first round of customers will receive their R1Ts in the Rivian blue color, which is pictured in these photos here and stuff. Now, the, I couldn't find any firm numbers uh, about uh, how many reservations there are for the R1T, but in mid-2020, there were about 30,000, so I would expect easily over 50,000 and probably as high as 100,000. Hard to say. Now, I'm not aware of the production run plans, i.e. how many units they plan on building in a month or in a year, but I can't comment on how long these reservation holders will have to wait. My guess, though, really, the reality is that it probably is going to be about a year or two to get through the current reservation backlog. But anyway, congratulations to Rivian for meeting their first major customer milestone, and I wish them the best of success. I'm hoping to see and drive the R1T one of these days soon. Switching gears to Ford, they've started pre-series production of the F-150 Lightning. Hmm, coincidence? I seem not. The electric pickup truck is scheduled for market launch next year in the spring of 2022. Now, due to the high demand, Ford has now confirmed that it will significantly increase production. Ford now has more than 150,000 reservations for the all-electric version of the F-150 pickup truck, which was announced in May. The production capacity for the F-150 Lightning was bumped up to 80,000 units per year due to this high demand, which Ford has now officially confirmed. The manufacturer is investing an additional 250 million U.S. dollars and creating 450 new jobs in the making of the electric pickup. The F-150 Lightning will be assembled at the Rouge Electric Vehicle Center, and the additional investments and jobs do not only concern the final assembly, but also the powertrain and component production at the Van Dyke Electric Powertrain Center and the Ronsonville Components Plant. Now, these pre-production vehicles now being built are to be subjected to various practical tests before deliveries to customers begin in spring of 2022. So I think these are beta prototypes for pre-production, and hopefully everything will pass and we'll see them come out next spring. Quickly about Mercedes-Benz, they've presented the concept EQT, a near production preview of the upcoming T-Class and the EQT electric model. Now, this is a smaller minivan. It's below the EQV, and it's being developed together in a cooperative agreement with Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi. Little specs have been provided other than the physical sizing, which is a length of about almost 5 meters and a width of 1.86 meters and a height of 1.83 meters. You can figure that out in feet. Now, Daimler has not yet disclosed any further technical data. However, it's speculated to have a 75 kilowatt electric motor and a 44 kilowatt hour battery. Or Mercedes could use the electric drive from its recently presented EQA and EQB compact SUVs. They have a 140 kilowatt front wheel drive motor and a 66 and a half kilowatt hour battery. Now, it seems Mercedes is targeting uh, as its main uh, market uh, target market. This is to be premium small van segment for families and private customers keen on leisure activities. It will not be a Chrysler minivan, I'll tell you that. But it is going to retain the EQ family styling, cues and inspirations that we see today. And it may arrive as early as later next year or into 2023. I'll just have to wait and see for, uh, for more info to come out from Mercedes, but good to see more stuff from them. 
A Polestar as well. They've been doing well with their Polestar 2. They've recently revealed some information about the Polestar 3. And that was recently at the IAA Mobility Show in Germany. This is an electric SUV, which will reportedly go into production next year, probably the end. And it'll only be offered with two rows of seats. There was some speculation if it's three row or two year. And it's going to be built in, in the U.S., more precisely at Volvo's Ridgeville plant in South Carolina. The Polestar 3, previously also announced as a performance e-SUV, is to be a crossover with a sloping roofline. There'll be single and dual-motored versions. Our plan, and the, and the Polestar 3, will also be based on a new generation of Volvo Car Group electric vehicle architecture, i.e. the successor to the current SPA platform, not the current CMA platform like the Polestar 2 is based on. No other information was announced, so I'll just have to keep on watching and waiting for more stuff to come, but good news to see more from Polestar. Staying with some European manufacturers, let's talk about BMW. They've announced an all-electric version of their 5 Series, called, of course, the i5. It's to be presented in 2023, and it'll also have an M variant. Now, it should be based on BMW's 5th generation E-Drive technology, which is the same family of drive type used in the iX3 or uh, the two new iX4 and iX, or sorry, the i4 and iX models. It's a lot of acronyms here. Now, technical data for an i5 are not mentioned yet. Only the output of a forthcoming M version is said to be more than 700 horsepower. Now, that seems about right, which is equivalent to about 515 kilowatts. BMW's battery kit is designed for prismatic cells, but modules can accommodate cells of different sizes and with different cell chemistries. So it's difficult to make a guess as to which battery BMW will fit into the i5, or more specifically, which i5 variant will get what battery type, because they could mix and match, and they probably will. And the interior, of course, of the i5 will be based on the iX and i4 designs that you have already seen. Official launch for this, as I mentioned, is not expected until the end of 2023, so we're a couple of years out, and it should hit showroom floors in 2024. So, uh, you know, it's a couple of years away, but BMW is taking steps to launch new EVs, especially all electrics, and I'm glad to see that, and I'll keep my eyes watching BMW for more stuff. Now, I'm going to talk about Foxconn, and this Taiwanese contractor um, has suspended its plans to cooperate with the struggling Chinese electric car startup, Byton. Now, insiders say that this is due to Byton's deteriorating financial situation, which is too bad. Now, in January of this year, both companies had announced that Foxconn would support Byton in bringing the m -Byte into series production by the first quarter of next year. And Byton had already started pre-series production of the m -Byte in October 2019, and they were on it on their way to series production, but then COVID hit and there were closures and they lost some funding or ran out of money. So in July of 2020, the company temporarily ceased operations because of COVID. The, the cooperation um, with Foxconn and the associated investment was seen as a lifeline for Byton's plans. Well, it seems the debt problems and the complex structure among Byton's shareholders has created far more difficulties than Foxconn had expected. Byton, on the other hand, faces more serious consequences of this breakup, looking unlikely to be able to keep to its Q1 2022 plan for series production without Foxconn, and Byton's future may be at an end soon. It's too bad because I really love to see more electrics offered, so I hope that they can keep going, but it doesn't seem unlikely unless they get some massive funding. Well, just have to wait and see what finally happens. If you have one on order, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what Biden is telling you. Now, my last story today is about the U.S. and the new EV incentives proposals that are being discussed. Now, many of us following the EV marketplace have been waiting for the new version of the U.S. electric vehicle tax credit to come out from Congress. Seems, so what, we're, what I'm hearing so far is that the wait is going to be worth it, as the revised bill has significantly reimagined the EV tax credit that consumers can get when they buy a new EV and there's an added credit for the second owner of the EV as well. Now, just to remind you, this is a necessary action because of how the tax credit is currently structured. Right now, if you buy an electric vehicle in the U.S. made by GM or Tesla, 
you're no longer eligible to take the tax credit because they passed the, the clip level. The new proposal from the Ways and Means Committee extends the credit for a decade and also changes the credit to make it better for consumers. And I love to hear this part. Now, the current credit is $7,500 for pretty much any EV on the marketplace. This bill allows up to $12,500 of credit, but that depends on a few factors, so it's kind of tiered. The base credit is $4,000 for any vehicle that has a battery capacity of 7 to 10 kilowatt hours, depending on the year of the manufacturer. Well, that's pretty well all EVs of any significance meet at least that. So you got four grand there. A higher battery capacity gets you more money. An additional 3,500 is added to the base amount if the battery capacity is 40 kilowatt hours or higher through to 2026 calendar year. And then after that, uh, 50 kilowatts or higher uh, after that to qualify for that additional $3,500. Again, most battery electric vehicles that are on the road that have any significant range meet this criteria. So that's a good thing. Now, if you're buying a plug-in hybrid vehicle, your credit will not get this bump. So the, that additional credit is only for BEVs. Good, because we need to push people into all electric vehicles not, and even move away from plug-in hybrids. To incentivize, uh, incentivize domestic assembly of EVs, so literally where the car is assembled, uh, and a workforce protected by a union, an additional $4,500 is available for vehicles manufactured in the U.S. by a unionized workforce. <laughs> so this seems to point a finger directly at Tesla, who, uh, if you don't know, I'm sure you do, they currently do not employ a unionized workforce. So anyway, that's the way it is. They are trying to not only push made in the USA, but they're trying to push unionized jobs, which isn't a bad thing in my opinion. And finally, 50% or more of all the components that make up the vehicle are made in the US, as well as the battery cells, you get an additional $500. So even for Tesla, they'll get that additional $500 bump because everything is made in the USA for them. And most others like GMs and Fords, and FCAs, they're all building these battery plants in the U.S. to align themselves with their vehicle productions. So how is the new EV uh, tax credit better for consumers? Well, in addition to the fact that you might be getting a $12,500 credit, you can now definitely take the incentive. This means that the tax credit can now work as a point of sale rebate giving you, the consumer, the value of the credit at the time you buy the car. A much better way to do it. Don't have to wait to file your income tax and see what you qualify for and take that amount off of your taxable income to hopefully you get a refund. This is applied at a point of sale, and, and that's the way we do it here in Canada, and that's the way it should be done in the U.S. So I'm really glad to hear that that's what they're proposing. Now, of course, there's always a catch. And there's a couple of catches. One is an income cap. So single, it's 400K. If you're single, 800K a year income if you're married. So it's not really a concern. That's going to help a lot of people. As well as a vehicle MSRP cap, similar to what we have here in Canada. Now, there are four caps, though, for different types of vehicles. The caps part of this means that you can't get the credit if the car, SUV, or truck you want to buy has a higher MSRP than these values. For sedans, it's $55,000 US. For vans, it's $64,000 US. For SUVs, it's $69,000. And for pickup trucks, it's $74,000. So those are pretty healthy clip levels that will get you into a lot of different uh, all-electric vehicles and even plug-in hybrid vehicles at those price points. So overall, the feedback and the response of this proposal has been very positive by what I'm hearing in the ranks of government circles. And most people seem to be happy with it, lobby groups, environment groups, and, and people in general. But wait, as we say in the commercials, there's more. There is also included an incentive for used EVs, which is great to hear. As such, Congress is putting in place a used car incentive of $2,500 or 30% of the purchase price, whichever is higher. It will be available only for the second owner of the vehicle, so only the, sec the second time it's sold, and if they make less than $150,000 of annual income per household, so total household income of less than $150,000. 
Now, why you ask is that? Well, the goal of this credit is to make sure that anyone and everyone can experience driving an EV and take advantage of the significant fuel savings and all the other benefits that EVs, especially all electrics, offer. So not just for people who can afford to buy new cars. And I think this is a key element. There's a lot of people where a 40 kilowatt Nissan Leaf or a uh, you know a 2018 after recalled battery retrofitted Bolt Chevy Bolt or whatever a lot of these vehicles that are out there are you know e-golf they're perfect for many many uh, smaller families or individuals that can't afford particularly to spend you know forty thousand fifty thousand on a new car but can get into a used EV at a very attractive price with this credit so I'm glad to see that this is part of that proposal. I really hope that all this passes and it becomes a reality and soon to help continue to spur the U.S. EV marketplace. All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you again for watching on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Always send me comments or if you have questions, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. If you're a Patreon supporter, you know who you are. Thank you very much for that. You can check the link below to get more information and continue to keep your eyes on the EV marketplace. Lots of stuff going on. One last comment I wanted to add is I am doing a, a small fundraiser for Hospital for Sick Children here in Toronto. Sick Kids, as it's called. Um, check out the link in the show notes if you feel that you want to contribute to that. It's a month long. I'm trying to lose a few pounds by getting a bit more active. It's working slowly. Uh, I'm just so busy. But if you could, if you feel like contributing to help hit, uh, me hit my goal of $300, it's a very small goal. I'd be very, very blessed if you could do that. Uh, and again, continue to watch the EV marketplace. There's all kinds of stuff happening. I hope everybody continues to stay safe and stay healthy. And until the next show, I will see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.